This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Thank you again for your attention and your support of the CHQI program. And I want to share with you our favorite part. Many of us who are involved in this, um, in CHQI, our absolute favorite part of the program is mentoring our brightest, our best, our most promising innovators who came to us not only with ideas, but with recommendations from their mentors on their campuses. You know who you are, but one of the mentors in this room called me at night, called me on the weekends, called me to share why his protege was so special that CHQI should know how special this uh, young faculty member is and was. And I've come to know that faculty member, I completely agree, and I think what a wonderful uh, place we work when mentors on the campuses feel that strongly about the individuals who they've helped to nurture and grow, that they've taken the time to reach out and say, I want to share this person's genius as UC Health is transitioning to effectuate the triple aim. I could use this person completely on my campus but this person has so much special to share. I want to share this person. And that's exactly what we heard from many of you in the audience who've served as mentors. And I can't stress enough the importance of mentorship. And for those of you who've agreed to serve as mentors in the fellowship program, um, my applause goes out to you and if everybody can, because mentorship is a two-way street. And we've, this is a new paradigm. We are asking our innovators, again, to think in terms of team-based collaborative care, to think about interdisciplinary uh, provision of care, and to reach out. And so this is our new way of approaching, one of our new ways of approaching uh, getting to better health care serving the needs of populations and doing this with an eye towards lowering our costs. So with that said, I want to briefly introduce um, five of our 10 2013 cohort of fellows. You'll get to meet the other five at their posters. So uh, to my immediate left, Maxime Cannison from UC Irvine will be talking about his project dealing with high-risk surgical patients. Robin Clark from UCLA, be talking about value and quality at UCLA. Nat Gleason from UCSF will be talking about the power of e-referrals. And we've got Jim Marson Davis talking about telemedicine and PEDS. And Vaishal Tolia from UC San Diego talking about uh, tit it's, the program is uh, titrating in the ED, but essentially um, being able to respond through telemedicine to surges in the ED as we anticipate more and more patients needing our services in the ED setting. So with that, we're going to turn this over to Maxine. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Terry, for the introduction. Um, my name is Maxime Kennison. I'm from UC Irvine. I am an anesthesiologist, and I'm going to present you my uh, project, uh, which is an enhanced recovery after surgery program to improve outcome in patients undergoing high-risk uh, surgery. These are my conflict of interest. I'm a speaker for these companies, and I have some uh, grant and fundings that I'm presenting here on this uh, slide. So when we think about uh, healthcare uh, quality and if we consider that healthcare should be a, a high reliability organization, ideally 
what we would like to uh, obtain is to have a very high level of care with a narrow uh, standard deviation. But in practice, what we observe most of the time, it's a pretty good level of care, but with wide standard deviation. And what we learn from uh, uh, quality improvement is that if we raise the lower bar of the healthcare quality, then mechanically we are going to increase the average level of care we provide to our patients. And this is all about the standardization of care and the application of evidence-based to our patients. Our program, the Enhanced Recovery After Surgery program, uh, the aim is to improve post-operative outcome of high-risk surgery patients. And the plan is to apply these best evidence, best practices that focus on four main variables, which are the post-operative pain management, the post-operative nausea and vomiting prevention, the intraoperative fluid management and hemodynamic optimization, both fall under the umbrella of what we call goal-directed therapy and blood transfusion. Most of these items, they are already in place in most of the hospitals within the UC Health system. However, our goal is to try to implement these variables that have been linked to post-operative outcome in a systematic fashion to all patients undergoing high-risk surgery. What is the conceptual framework behind this program? It relies on the relationship between the volume status of patients undergoing high-risk surgery and the rates of perioperative complication. What we know, it's been shown uh, many, many times in many institutions all over the world, is that there is a U-shape relationship between the volumic status of high-risk surgery patients and perioperative complication. And either some patients present with hypervolemia during surgery or hypovolemia, in both situations, this is going to increase the rate of postoperative complication. Related to this physiological evidence, we have a lot of studies, more than 25 or stu uh, 30 studies, showing that during high risk surgery, when fluid and hemodynamics are optimized, we observe an improvement in postoperative morbidity, an improvement in postoperative mortality, a decrease in the length of stay in the hospital, and overall a decrease in the cost of the surgical procedure. This uh, meta-analysis has been published two years ago. It's a study coming from the UK. Uh, it includes 2,400 patients, and very clearly, uh, this approach has been shown to improve patient outcome. This evidence has been deemed strong enough by some uh, institutions in Europe, like in uh, Denmark, the UK, in Sweden, and recently in France, to come up with very strong recommendations about a systematic approach for fluid management and hemodynamic optimization of patients undergoing high-risk surgery. For example, in the UK, the NHS released in 2011 this recommendation, and they estimate that if this approach was applied in all patients undergoing high-risk surgery in the UK. This would benefit about 800,000 patients every year, and it would make net financial savings of over 400 million pounds, which is about 600 million dollars every year for the NHS. In January 2013, the NHS now has some incentive, and 2.5% of the budget of NHS hospital rely on the application of this concept. So we have the knowledge, we know the physiology, we have the evidence-based medicine showing the improvement in outcome, we have the tools to apply it at the bedside, so do we do it? In 2011, we conducted a survey uh, at UC Irvine among uh, anesthesiologists from the American Society of Anesthesiology and European Society of Anesthesiology, and we showed, as you can see here, that in the vast majority of institutions, there is no guidelines, no protocol for fluid management and hemodynamic optimization for patients undergoing high-risk surgery, despite all of the evidence. So what did we do at UC Irvine in order to try to change the practice uh, related to fluid management and hemodynamic optimization in this population. The approach we wanted to apply is a patient-centered approach, and the goal is to improve patient satisfaction, the improve efficiency, innovation, and the teamwork of all the healthcare providers taking care of this patient in the perioperative period. We started by building a, a, a team of clinical practitioners 
in order to identify high-risk surgery patients. And as soon as we identify the high-risk surgery patient, we place them in some kind of clinical pathway. To achieve this goal, we were uh, supported by our uh, uh, chairman, Dr. Kane, and the uh, vice chair for quality. We had the support also from the administration that helped us uh, with billing and all the process related to the administration. And uh, when we applied for this uh, CHQI fellowship, we had the backup from our chief medical officer. This project also was included in a vast group of perioperative healthcare providers, including the nurses, the anesthesiology uh, technician, the information technology people, the surgeon, residents, and so it's a team approach for the improvement of this patient. The first thing we did was to try to change the knowledge related to fluid management, hemodynamic optimization, and outcome related to high-risk surgery patients. So we developed a curriculum which was mandatory for all CRNAs, residents, and anesthesiologists in charge of this patient. We had an online training uh, and a bedside training to apply the concept at the bedside with the, the team leaders. And we, we did a pretest before the implementation of the learning module and after the implementation. We used the intranet from our department to present all the modules for teaching the concept and uh, having all practitioners had to apply it at the bedside. You can see an example of all the modules, uh, the uh, education with audio, videos, and so forth. So it was online for three months, and once again, it was mandatory for everyone. We use technology like the anesthesia information management system to track the application of this concept at the bedside so that we were able to measure whether or not this concept was applied for the patient. The way we assess this uh, project, we did a baseline evaluation one year. It's a historical group. Then we started the training three months with a pretest before and a post -test after the training, and then the implementation. For, uh, five, for one year, and we used what we call a quasi-experimental study design to assess uh, the impact. We focused on the three main surgery, pancreatic, liver, and cancer debulking, which are the highest risk surgery patient. And we started with this small population in order then to expand it to other, uh, other patient population. What you observe is that uh, before the implementation, the implementation of the full ERAS program was only 8%. After we started this training, it went up to 62% of the patient undergoing high-risk surgery. We were able, one of the most uh, important impact has been on the decrease in fluid administration. We decreased fluid by about 40%, especially on the crystalloid. We decreased the crystalloid by 40%. And this has been uh, linked to a decreased transfusion by 45% to 35% of the patient, just probably because w the less we dilute the patient, the less we see a drop in hematocrit, and then the, more, the less likely we are to transfuse patients who just have hemodilution. Uh, at the same time, we observed a slight decrease in length of stay. It's not significant yet. We hope that at the end of the project, we'll be able to show significance. But as you know, these outcome data are not normally distributed, so we need a lot of patients to see an impact on, uh, on outcome. But this is here what we call a time series analysis, where here you have the time, the date, when we started the program. This dashed line here is the beginning of the intervention, and here you have the length of stay in the hospital. And you can see that before we, the implementation of this program, so we had a lot of patients who stayed a very long time, and that after the implementation, we still have patients with complication. We cannot make them disappear. We still have some complication, but overall, the incidence of these patients staying a long time in the hospital uh, decreased dramatically uh, compared to before the implementation. So as a conclusion, this implementation uh, during high-risk surgery, the implementation of this ERAS program, which is based on, once again, evidence-based medicine. It's not rocket science. It's very basic uh, clinical implementation. It induced first a significant change in the knowledge that led to a significant change in practice. And then uh, this change in knowledge and practice induced a decrease in blood transfusion and it looks like we have a trend toward a decrease in the length of stay in the hospital, in the ICU. And we did not do a financial analysis, but it's more likely that it will have an impact too. So the perspective is to implement this ERAS program first at UC Irvine on one specific high-risk surgery. We go for an easy win, because these are the patients with long length of stay, and then spread it out to other surgery and hopefully to other uh, institution within the UC uh, system. Thank you very much. I want to thank the CHQI for giving me this opportunity. 
It's been a huge uh, opportunity for me to bring all my basic research on cardiovascular physiology then to the clinical bedside. Thank you very much. Morning, my name is uh, Robin Clark. I'm the Medical Director of Quality for uh, UCLA's Faculty Practice Group. And my uh, CHQI presentation is entitled Engaging Faculty in Value-Based Improvement, Choosing Wisely. Uh, UCLA Health is uh, composed of the UCLA uh, Faculty Practice Group, the UCLA Medical Group, and uh, the UCLA Hospital System. We have around 1,250 faculty physicians that are based within 18 academic departments. Uh, we are uh, now implementing an enterprise-wide uh, EPIC-based electronic medical record. And through a concerted effort, uh, the UCLA ACO has around 100,000 patients that are currently in some form of value-based arrangement. My CHQI project is uh, aimed at laying the foundation for success as we move as a health system to provide more value-based care. Specifically, my CHQI project objectives are within the academic departments to develop the infrastructure for value-based improvement by one, developing the faculty culture to discuss appropriate care and promote systematic improvement projects, and two, by developing our measurement system to track care pathways and feedback data to our faculty. There are three uh, core components to uh, building this value-based infrastructure at UCLA. The first is my faculty practice group team, composed of myself as the medical director, an assistant director who is a graduate student, and one or more data programmers. The second uh, core component is our health systems uh, data repository, which integrates clinical, administrative, and other types of data into a single warehouse. And the last crucial component um, is faculty involvement. And we are, currently have 46 faculty quality officers based within the academic departments. My CHQA project uses a standardized structured approach to integrate these three components with the objectives that by the end of 2013, every department will have equality teams that are reviewing their performance and will have automated data uh, on quality measures that will be fed to those quality teams. I'm going to spend the uh, presentation describing the standardized structured approach. The uh, design of the uh, engagement with the faculty has specifically been um, uh, developed to be bottom-up and collaborative in nature. Uh, the first crucial step in this is that a uh, faculty quality officer has been uh, designated for each of the clinical departments and divisions. I have uh, engaged these quality officers extensively through um, monthly group meetings and regular individual meetings uh, with each and every one of the quality officers. I have found that they are eager for systematic data about their clinical practice. Uh, to develop these systematic data, I have asked them to um, define measures for underutilization, that is, uh, not providing enough evidence-based services. Uh, and overutilization, that is, providing ser services beyond uh, what is necessary or effective. In the process of uh, developing these quality measures, um, I found that the quality officers initially uh, focused on addressing uh, underutilization. I believe this is likely related to um, that many validated uh, national measures exist in this field, and they are uh, used to being uh, assessed in this manner. Therefore, they were easily able to elect departmental quality priorities for underutilization. In slight contrast, um, they were receptive but less experienced with addressing um, overutilization. Again, this is likely because there are fewer nationally validated quality measures for this. So consequently, my project needed an additional device to engage the quality officers and their quality teams in identifying overutilization. Uh, the additional device was the Choosing Wisely program that I will discuss in a few moments. But first, I wanted to illustrate how we are defining and implementing these quality measures. This is an example from uh, the Department of Neurology and how they are addressing underutilization of screening for complications for multiple sclerosis patients. Using our standardized structured approach, the Neurology Quality Officer has identified a population of interest, in this case, multiple sclerosis patients and identified a outcome that meaningfully drives care for that population, in this case, urinary tract infections. My faculty practice group team then defines and programs the quality measure into our uh, centralized data repository. Uh, we feed back data on urinary tract rate infections by uh, patient characteristics, by provider, and by facility to the neurology qual quality team that use that information to describe the care pathway by which, that describe the care pathway and the process steps by which um, a multiple sclerosis patient either gets or avoids a urinary tract infection. 
One of these important process steps um, is, um, is whether a, a patient received a bladder scan to, uh, to screen for urinary retention. The use of these bladder scans is uh, currently inconsistent. That's why this care pathway is not straight. However, by measuring the use of these bladder scans, targeting them to our at-risk multiple sclerosis patients, we can more reliably deliver them, we can straighten out this care pathway, and we can optimize our um, rates of urinary tract infections. We can also measure the downstream effects on hospitalization, sepsis, and uh, mortality for these uh, chronically ill patients. So in summary, with a, a few uh, short steps, we're able to um, engage faculty and develop a measurement system that is actually designed by and for the clinicians that are going to use the data. That was an example of how we're developing measures for underutilization. And as I mentioned, we're using the Choosing Wisely program to uh, help um, faculty address overutilization. The Choosing Wisely program is a national program spearheaded by the ABIM Foundation, which asks uh, professional societies to identify five overused services within their field. There's been excellent participation in the Choosing Wisely program over the past year, and the main aim of the program is to encourage physician-patient discussions about care decisions. We're innovating and using um, these, these Choosing Wisely lists created by the professional societies to initiate UCLA faculty discussions about value of care. This is an example of how the Department of Pediatrics is using uh, the Choosing Wisely list that was created by the American Academy of Pediatrics to address overutilization of, pediatric, of uh, imaging for pediatric head trauma. Again, using our structured approach, the uh, pediatrics quality officer defined a population. Here, children who have experienced a low impact head trauma and an outcome of interest, which is uh, the receipt of uh, head CT by facility and by physician. My, uh, again, my faculty practice group team then defines and internally um, programs that measure, feeds the data back to the pediatrics quality team who de defines the care pathway. Um, and one of the, uh, the process steps along this care pathway is the use of decision instruments that guide the um, ordering process for um, whether a child needs a CT scan or not. These uh, decision instruments are inconsistently used, and again, we have a non-straight pathway. However, by measuring the use of these uh, instruments, feeding the data back to the pediatrics quality team, we can more reliably use these instruments, straighten out the care pathway, and optimize the use of CT scans for these children. We can also measure downstream to ensure that uh, there are no adverse events and complete this, uh, the full description of the care pathway. This slide um, displays the timeline and our progress to date of this uh, CHQI project. Again, the two objectives were to uh, develop our faculty and develop our measurement system over the course of the calendar year of 2013. These are the specific steps um, uh, in this standardized approach that I've just il illustrated through the examples from uh, the departments of pediatrics and uh, neurology. And in keeping with our aim to scale up this approach across, all, across the entire health system, all 37 divisions and departments within the health system are progressing through um, these various steps. And I'm happy to report that within a few short months, new quality teams have emerged, they're receiving data about their clinical practices, and they're starting to describe these care pathways. This, these pie charts uh, dis, um, display the progression um, from the left to right through these steps. So what I've described in this presentation through this project is a um, standardized approach for engaging faculty, for uh, developing a measurement system, and for laying the foundation for value-based improvement. My preliminary pro um, observations from the project are that this uh, approach has been broadly accepted with the faculty embracing the program and voicing little concern about uh, in measurement, transparency, and accountability that are often associated with uh, traditional quality improvement projects. Additionally, this approach is very scalable uh, because the clinician engagement is, um, is isolated to just defining um, the measures, while the project support team handles all the technical aspects of uh, programming and uh, d obtaining the data. Lastly, this um, approach is foundational for uh, other UCLA goals of sustainably and effectively addressing over and under utilization as more data become available and becoming uh, increasingly more successful in delivering high value care. Again, thank you very much to Terry and to the Center for uh, the support of this fellowship. My name is Nat Gleason. 
I'm a UCSF general internist. I'm our physician lead for our Department of Medicine initiative on e-consult and e-referral. It's really a pleasure to be here, and thank you to Terry and the Operations Committee and the Board for giving me this chance. I get to talk about Mark Larratt's future state, which is fun. Um, and it's, it's actually a nice segue. The, the idea that a physician visit is not necessarily the best way to deliver care has already come up twice this morning, so I couldn't ask for a better segue. I mean, if you imagine a nurse, say, for instance, who uh, gets her annual PPD test and tests positive for latent TB. She has a negative chest film, and you're wondering if she should be treated, but she's breastfeeding, right? And so I look it up, and it looks like she could, it looks like the medicine is safe, but she's not totally convinced, and I'm honestly not totally convinced either, and that's when a PCP looks to refer, right? I have a question. But this is a question that doesn't really involve a physical exam, right? It's just a data-driven question, and she'd like a quick answer. And so uh, it's a case where sending, some, sending an e-consult rather than re the, the traditional solution to this, right, is I refer her, and she's a savvy consumer, so in this particular case, let's say she says, you know, I'd really like to see the infectious disease doctor to ask this question. So our objective was to build an e-consult system at UCSF that met the needs of patients and PCPs and specialists and the system, and we think we, this is a real rare case of a real quadruple win. We obviously need a, a sustainable, viable financial model. I mean, if you think about it, the safety net, San Francisco General in particular, pioneered by Alice Chen, who's here, is five years ahead on this. So when the incentives are right, people ask questions electronically, but our system right now in UCSF, there's been literally no uptake of that model because that's not what we pay people to do. So we needed to do a model which would work now. And I'll show you that's basically fee for question answered, but it also is forward looking. So it prepares us for when we're looking at more integrated payment models as well. So I'm going to walk you through the why, just looking at each stakeholder quickly. If you think about the patient, and I gave you this example already, but the patient has a problem right now. And the other big factor for patients is that sometimes another appointment is not always welcome, right? The time away from work and the childcare and the co-payment and the transportation and parking and childcare costs, it's expensive, it's time consuming, it's not efficient. Um, from my perspective as the PCP, you know, getting quick access to specialty guidance for a question that's focused and when I have the available data that I can just transmit and I want to maintain management of that problem. Right? Um, and the relational continuity that provides, so I get to continue to take care of the patient with, around that problem, uh, but with the, uh, with the added input from the specialist. And the co-management burden that PCPs face, I think, is increasingly recognized. So this is another big piece of the puzzle for me that's really compelling. This is a real patient, so the patient sees a cardiologist, two endocrinologists, this is real, diabetes and for lipids, right? Sees a nephrologist, a sleep medicine doc, a urologist, a pulmonary doc. So I have a focused question about this patient. The patient comes up with an incidental pulmonary nodule, and it's, it's not conforming exactly to what the standards are, so I don't quite feel like I can proceed based on the recommended protocols. I want some input. So it would be great if I could answer this question without adding, an, I'd like to shrink this list, right? <laughs> That's another conversation and something we're working on at UCSF. But I certainly would not, I'd, I would like to avoid adding another physician to the mix here for this patient. So if I can ask this question without doing that, it's really a win for everyone. From the specialist standpoint, we're asking our specialists to improve access, right? At UCs, all UCs struggle with access. We have a supply-demand problem. And our specialists tell us they would like an efficient way to address low complexity questions, right? They view their core competence as the high complexity question. They tell us they want to see the lupus nephritis patient from the Central Valley, right? Not the osteoarthritis patient. And so this kind of a system can help them with that. And it's better for their training model as well. Their fellows need to see the higher complexity patient to train the next generation. Also, when you answer a question quickly, say uh, offline via email or something, which is our, our only alternative to this previously, the question doesn't make it into the EMR, and the, the uh, specialist is not reimbursed for the work. From the purchaser standpoint, I think this is a, a really clear case. So this is the purchaser, the payer, the supermarket chain that's trying to insure its employees. We see some unbelievable, really stunning data. So one in three patients in the U.S. is referred to a specialist every year, and it's one in two in the elderly. It's twice the rate of referral in the U.K., and that's comparing a managed care population to the NHS. And the referral rate doubled in the last 10 years. 
So uh, this is the sort of scope of our program. We've engaged all of the primary care practices across UCSF that see adults. And all, at this point, we have uh, developed a program within all of our medicine subspecialty programs, our, depart our divisions. Uh, the, the, uh, we have a strong partner in the medical center, and the funding comes through the district program. What we recognized going into this is that we couldn't jump straight into e-consult. We had basically taken the old-fashioned paper referral and just transposed it onto the computer, right? So people were still writing referrals that said one word, like GERD or OSA. And so the idea, if you ask a specialist, hey, do you think you could field some of this stuff electronically? They just didn't have enough, of a, enough experience with high-quality referrals to imagine being able to answer a question coherently. And so we started off actually, before we launched the, the e-consult, we started off with just developing a structured referral template. Um, and the template is some, some essential elements of the template. They're, the template's based on the ACP's patient-centered medical home neighborhood set of principles. And the template, is, it's, it's not rocket science, but it basically elicits the consultative question. The pre it, it allows the PCP to see what are the pre-referral expectations that, this, uh, th that, that the specialist has for this particular diagnosis or problem, and it populates with relevant data. I'll show you an example. I think it's easier to see. Um, so uh, this is an osteoporosis template, and it begins with what's really what you could call appropriateness criteria or decision support. It says, I'm referring so-and-so to endocrinology for evaluation and treatment of osteoporosis. At least one of the following is present, and this is the endocrine division's chance to convey to the PCP, you know, they should have one of these things, or it may not be the best use of our service, because we're really trying to work on our access to take care of patients who really need an endocrinologist. Um, and then the next piece of the template is, uh, it says the following results are available in APEX, that's our EMR. So this is them saying, I would like you to have this stuff all packaged before you send the patient. Um, and this avoids that initial physician visit where the, physician, the specialist doesn't have all of the data and then they have to do a follow-up visit just to do those missing studies in the interim, which isn't good for the patient or the system. Um, and then uh, the data populate into the template and then it elicits the consultative question. And I'll just tell you, um, it's, this is an aside, but we've had a, a, an increase in our use of a consultative question with a referral from 45% of people asking a real question a focused question, to 97% by introducing these templates. Because I think physicians feel that they're now communicating to another physician. It's not simply um, an administrative action. So some specifics. This is a crowd that probably wants to hear the specifics of how we're doing this. Um, when a specialist receives an e-consult, they can convert it to a, to a, to a standard visit for the, based on the complexity. So they just send a message that says, this sounds a little bit complicated, I'd like to see the patient, and then that patient is scheduled as soon as possible in the specialty practice. We have a 72-hour expectation for turnaround time from the specialist, and we're compensating the specialist one point, or 0 0.5 RVUs per question answered. We also credit the PCP, 0 0.5 RVUs, and this is an acknowledgment of the fact that they're not delegating this problem, right? They're gonna maintain management over the problem and they're gonna integrate and implement the specialist recommendations. And um, the consultations are fielded by, uh, by senior specialists. Um, so here's our adoption data. We've had 550 e-consults so far since last September. Um, about 14% are converted to visits. Uh, most are completed within 72 hours, and I think this distribution is probably hard to read, but uh, the tallest line there is 100 in uh, endocrinology, so that's a very, uh, it's a field where there's a lot of data-driven questions. Um, uh, the, some of the smaller bar lines are just coming online recently. Uh, hematology has done a number, and they're brand new, so that's proving to be a very uh, um, compatible uh, uh, type of set of questions. So we have some nice data on the acceptability. From the specialist side, we ask people immediately upon completing an e-consult exchange, we ask them a few questions. So specialists find that the, um, that the e-consult questions are clear. They find that the, the complexity of the e-consult question is relatively appropriate. Specialists spend an average of about 10 minutes doing each of these. Uh, more than half of them spend less than 10 minutes. About a third of them spend between 10 and 20 minutes. And the PCPs overwhelmingly find the responses helpful. This is my favorite question, I think. They overwhelmingly find that the response influenced their care plan. And then this is our adoption, or, or rather our utilization data. So the way this is represented, so it's time along the x-axis. And the uh, y-axis is a rate. So this is referrals per 100 primary care visits to the specialty practices that we have engaged in this innovation, right, to all the medicine subspecialties. 
So the red line is referrals for office visits, which prior to the middle of the graph is the only option, right? And then you see the green line emerge at the bottom, and that's the introduction of e-consults. So those are e-consults, and they represent about 10% of all referrals now. The blue line at the top is e-consults plus standard referrals. And our concern was that that blue line would be higher than the initial red line at the baseline. Because it's kind of easy to ask a question, right? And you might, it, we might induce demand with this. We, someone might say, well, boy, it's so easy to just ask any consult question. Maybe I'll just ask the specialist. And we see that we haven't induced demand. In fact, the overall referral rate is lower than it was before we started. So there's some co-intervention going on. And we think it's probably just the amount of discussion we've had around utilization of specialty care uh, in the context of doing uh, these interventions. So what's the economic impact? Well, a standard referral, which is the, 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 the benchmark, if I need to send a patient to a, a, patient to a specialist, they're going to see uh, they have a new patient visit built in an E&M code at uh, 2.4 to 3.2 RVUs. That's a level four or five new patient visit. In Medicare dollars, that's 143 to 184 dollars. And if you compare that to an e-consult, where we have half an RVU to the specialist and half an RVU to the PCP, that's $57. So that's about three to one, which looks good, right? But we all know that that's not actually the whole story, right? Nobody goes to a specialist once, right? And the specialist, we know that specialty care is more expensive than primary care as well. So the, the actual calculation here is going to take some more time to unfold, and it's going to take a sort of episode of care type analysis, which we're looking forward to doing. Um, but we'll need to look at once two patients who are roughly equivalent, when one's referred to a specialist, how many subsequent visits and how many extra tests do they get compared to a patient uh, whose care is managed via e-consult? So we've had a significant impact on referral rates. Um, e-consult does not appear to induce demand. We've had high acceptability among PCPs and specialists. We're very interested in looking at patients in terms of acceptability. Um, Building those referral templates really fundamentally changed the dynamic between PCPs and specialists, too, which has been an important benefit. So I want to emphasize something. This is, this is high-quality patient-centered care. This is not cost at the expense of quality. These are quick, you know, as a PCP doing these, it's the timely access to, to specialty input is really, really appreciated, deeply appreciated by patients, and I get to maintain that, that relationship continuity. Um, it decreases the, care, the complexity of care management. And just for, you know, sort of the feel-good factor, I think we're saving patients a lot of money in just those expenses in terms of co-pays, parking, transportation, child care, et cetera. I think this is important for training uh, the physicians of the future. And um, we need, so I mentioned we're using DISRIP funding, and we need a model for sustainability. I think we have a very strong value proposition, and now we are ready to explore partnerships with payers who are interested. And I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators. Thank you very much. Hi there. Um, I'm Jim Marson. I'm one of the pediatric ICU docs at UC Davis um, at Children's Hospital there. And uh, my my talk is going to be on the implementation of telemedicine and telehealth technologies in the Children's Hospital and in the Department of Pediatrics uh, with three goals in mind. Um, that's to increase access to children that don't have otherwise access to pediatric subspecialists, particularly in the rural and underserved communities, um, increasing the quality of care and reducing overall health care costs. And no, this is not cold fusion, um, but this is a way that we can leverage technology to actually attain all of these three simultaneously. A little bit about the UC Davis Telehealth uh, Network, uh, started by Dr. Tom Nesbitt, who's here. Um, currently, we have seen more than 35,000 uh, patients for live interactive telemedicine consultations since inception, and we regularly connect to more than 100 sites throughout the state, as well as outside of the state, um, to provide subspecialty care primarily for patients that don't have to travel to UC Davis. Um, I'm going to really focus on pediatrics, not that I don't care about adults. Um, my wife tells me sometimes that I occasionally act like one, um, but we, that's where, as a pediatrician, that's where we've been focusing with all of our implementation of this. We have done more than 5,500 telemedicine consultations in, in, since inception, and we focus primarily on the outpatient clinics, and everybody's familiar with outpatient telemedicine. 
um, interpretation of studies, downloading EEGs, echoes, teleradiology, which is now a standard of care. But we're also using these technologies um, to be used by advanced practice providers, as well as in emergency departments and inpatient wards um, and in the intensive care unit. So I'll focus a little bit on each of these. First, regarding the use of it in outpatient telemedicine, again, UC Davis has continued to expand its use um, in this arena. We have four telemedicine suites. These are pictures of our older ones. Now we have uh, newer and fancier ones in our new building um, that run. And so a doc can come in in the morning, uh, spend a morning clinic or a full day in clinic um, in front of the monitors here seeing patients throughout Northern California. We have seen that it increases the efficiency of specialists because a lot of the overheads that tend to be more expensive at the centers of excellence are transferred to the remote site. So it's their nurses and their staff that are checking in the patients and our doctors are able just to use uh, the room that way. It simultaneously provides education to the remote providers and uh, I have underneath their project ECHO and I'll talk to you a little bit uh, later on that in the slide, but as you can imagine, when the PCP is involved, their education level on the management of that disease increases. Um, we also find that it can increase the optimization of the tertiary center so that those patients that need to come to the tertiary and quaternary centers are the ones that really uh, come to the center. And if they can be managed remotely, we tend to, uh, that's a more efficient utilization of our resources. So. Another application is it's not just for physicians, but there's advanced practice providers that were really trying to incorporate their use of this technology as well. I have several examples up there. Our audiologists at UC Davis are using it now, and we have taken the one of the highest uh, loss to follow-up rate for infants that fail their newborn hearing screening in the country down to essentially zero with the use of this technology. Um, and Simon here is seeing a baby remotely in uh, Redding, California this way. We've used it for speech language uh, therapy, lactation consultants, other therapists, uh, sexual abuse response team nurses have used this technology. Um, and even our behavioral pediatricians and sociologists are using it for what's called parent-child interaction therapy, or PCIT, where we're training the trainers in the state on how to um, use this PCIT therapy. Um, one of the things that I've been working on for about 10 years is the implementation of telemedicine in remote, rural, and underserved emergency departments. And the idea behind this is that to use video conferencing so that when a sick kid comes into a, a critical access hospital, for example, that we're able to hook up and see the child, see the parent, and see what's all going on with that child. And this has been an ever-growing um, endeavor and very successful from our standpoint, where specialists are able to consult, again, the community and rural hospitals. We're finding a lot of data. The uh, next slide, I'll show you some data on reducing overall health care costs, reducing transfer rates, and it's really just become a win-win uh, and financially sustainable model where now we're up to 24, um, 25 emergency departments in Northern California. So this is like a typical doctor reaction. Sorry about the four um, data points on this one slide, but you know people say, oh, you can only have 10 slides, and your doctor's like, oh, you can't tell a doctor what to do, so I jammed a bunch of data on <laughs> <clears throat> on the slide here. And then we blame the administrators. It's their fault that you can't see this. Uh, but up in the upper left is parent satisfaction, and we compare um, the parent satisfaction when there, there's a consultation involving video conferencing versus a telephone. Similarly, sick kids and across the board, statistically significant. The parents like the use of this technology, feel that they're getting higher uh, quality of care. In the upper right is provider satisfaction. We asked the remote ED physicians how frequently did the consultation in telemedicine, which is yellow, versus to uh, tell a phone, which is in red, change in your diagnosis, change in your intervention, change in your disposition, and overall across the board they were happier with the use of video conferencing. Uh, these two data are going to be published in uh, Critical Care Medicine. Uh, soon, coming out in uh, June. Um, in the lower left is medication errors. We also have an impact on patient safety of these children uh, seen by tele uh, video conferencing. And the purple is the when, when they get no consultation, telephone is in red, and telemedicine 
um, is in yellow. As you can see, it's a stepwise reduction in medication errors among the similarly sick cohort of children seen in emergency department. And then we also applied a rigorous uh, implicit review instrument um, on, to measure quality of care. And again, we see the stepwise increase in quality care with, when these technologies are used. And we're now currently working with healthcare economists on the UC Davis campus to demonstrate that this is also indeed, as you can imagine, a, a big cost savings because we end up reducing the number of transfers to our tertiary center, help them care for the kids in the local community, 30% uh, reduction in utilization of helicopters and things like that. So it's a, a really win-win for all. The other thing that we're using the um, technology for is something called Project Echo or Extension of community, for Community Healthcare. This is originally started at the University of New Mexico with patients with hepatitis C, but to use this technology not only just to uh, deliver direct patient care for patients, but to deliver it to a, um, a group of PCPs, a provider, so that they're able to educate them on how to better take care of the patients with hepatitis C or whatever their, uh, whatever their uh, specialty, specialty is. And so we've been doing this at UC Davis with PCIT therapy, we've started with chronic pain management, and it's a new model of care that's going to result in an increased capacity, right? So you help community providers, nurse practitioner, physicians, raise a level of care that they're able to provide for their local um, for their local patients. And again, this is a very financially sustainable model. This is the last slide here, um, and we are waiting. As we go from a healthcare system which reimburses us for the treatment of disease um, to providing uh, health care to patients, the use of home, health, home telehealth technologies is really going to expand. And no matter what disease or disease management you're thinking of, whether it's patients with heart disease, diabetes, asthma, hypertension, there's been many, many studies uh, done to demonstrate that these, the use of relatively inexpensive home health technologies can reduce admissions and improve the level of health care that these, uh, these patients are at. And as you know, the VA is very cognizant of this, as is Kaiser, because they use a lot of these home health technologies. Um, and so overall, our objective, our team, is to use these uh, telehealth technologies, again, to increase access for pediatric patients, um, improve the overall quality, and we can simultaneously reduce the overall uh, health care costs. And I really wanted to quickly uh, acknowledge and thank very much my mentors and supporters for this work, both on the health system side with Ann Madam Rice, Carol Robinson, and on the School of Medicine side with Dean Claire Pomeroy and uh, Tom Nesbitt for their support with this. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Vaishal Tolia. I'm an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at UC San Diego Health System. And my project continues the theme of telehealth and uh, e-health technology, and it's entitled ED Titrate, which is the Emergency Department Telemedicine Initiative to Rapidly Accommodate in Times of Emergency. The reason I chose this project is really behind the premise of emergency department challenges that all EDs are facing across the nation. We know that from 1997 till 2009, we've seen an annual increase of over 40 million patients that are seen in our nation's emergency departments. Not only that, but hospitals are increasingly operating at full capacity, which causes the problem of overcrowding and increased wait times in the emergency department. Those wait times translate to unproductive time for patients where they're lingering in pain or unable to see a provider or get the care that they need. And in many cases, those patients actually leave without being seen. And we know that patients who leave without being seen uh, have higher patient safety risk and adverse events and also lost revenue for the health system. That variable demand for resources is part of the problem. And matching the resources that we have with the demand uh, is an increasing challenge in emergency department care and staffing. So in the past, health systems have responded in a couple of different ways. One is to simply place a physician in triage. So every patient that comes in at the time of triage with a triage nurse gets seen by a physician and care at least gets initiated. We know that these fixed shifts actually result in variable cost effectiveness because the physician is there for a fixed amount of time and they may or may not be needed during that time. And then when they leave, that's usually when the patient surge occurs, of course. So to better match that time and need of resource, uh, some places have gone to a backup system, an, an on-call system for emergency physicians, though this is also fraught with some complications. 
One thing is the delay in initiation, something we've termed activation energy. What activation energy is, is the reluctance for the provider who is currently working in the ED to ask for help, to actually call in an additional physician. There's also some reluctance from the home physician to come in and say, you know, the emergency department's full, the waiting room's full, what am I really going to be able to do? There's also travel time for that physician. Once that backup physician is activated to come in from home and, and then eventually leave. And then there's something what we've termed deactivation energy, which is once that physician is there, they tend to linger and they tend to stay because the last thing they want is to go home and then be called back an hour later. So matching that physician and nurse resource with the patient need is part of the major challenge that overcrowded EDs face in our country. And that's where emergency department telemedicine comes into play. It's really an innovative use of telehealth that's never been done before in, in primarily evaluating patients in the emergency department. We really effectively apply this just-in-time use of our physician and nurse resource. It actually dramatically reduces this activation and deactivation energy that I was referring to, and it has the potential to be very cost-effective, because during a per given period of time, this process can be turned on, then turned off again, turned on again, at, at any time that the patient surge or care demands it. So our project, ED Titrate, is an IRB-approved study. At this point, it's a pilot project really to evaluate the safety, the satisfaction, the acceptance, and we're also looking at other metrics like cost-effectiveness and length of stay. Some of the logistics of this project is that we have a full mobile telemedicine cart in our emergency department, and several of the rooms adjacent to the waiting room are wired for this module. We have an, a nurse doing administrative duties each day who then can easily be switched to the telemedicine role. We have a physician on call, and currently, the, in, during the pilot phase of this project, it's from noon till 8, Monday through Friday. The patient care from the telemedicine physician can either be taken to completion or patient seen and then sent back to the waiting room if appropriate and that care initiated, or if necessary and the clinical scenario dictates, that patient can easily be handed off to the on-site physician. For patients that are uh, taken to full completion and are ready for disposition, which represents about 94% of the patients in, in our group so far, that those findings and disposition plan are confirmed with the on-site physician so that we can demonstrate uh, that this is a safe encounter. These are just a couple images of what our module looks like. You can see on the left that there is a, uh, a high-definition camera here. I can actually control this camera from home, pan, tilt, zoom, and, and get fantastic images of, of uh, rashes or other uh, areas that uh, the nurse is assisting me in examining. A little close-up view of the module shows some of the peripherals. I can actually auscultate heart, lung sounds, abdominal sounds, uh, bowel sounds, uh, as well as examine ears, throat. The patients love this because when I tell them that they have an ear infection, they look in the e I'm looking in the ears with the assistance of the nurse, and they're seeing that image on the screen as well. So they're actively participating in their health care. From a safety standpoint, we again have that on-site physician confirm some of the findings uh, and the plan of the telemedicine physician. We do a 48-hour patient callback, one, to see how they're doing, and two, to make sure that you know, they enjoyed this process and if they have any comments for us. Uh, we've had even patients comment to us, I'm really sorry about all the earwax that I had on the exam. Um, so you know, they're, they're very, very happy with the technology and, and you know, really uh, enjoy participating in it. And then from a chart review, we look at patients seven days after their visit to ensure that they didn't return to the emergency department or have an adverse outcome. Some of the preliminary outcomes have been interesting. We're still very early in our study. We've uh, had about 60 patients uh, in initially, mainly from January through the end of March. Um, but we've surveyed each of the providers, the telemedicine and on-site provider, as well as the nurse and the patient. The, from a score of one to five, five being highly satisfied with the encounter, the providers average about 4.7. Interestingly, the patients with, the, again, 60 patients, the mean score is about 4.9. So they've been very, very satisfied with the encounter. The average uh, 
triage category uh, is a triage category of four. So one being the highest acuity patient, five being the lowest acuity. We tend to see lower acuity patients through the telemedicine module. That's not to say that we can't and haven't seen sicker patients that you know, have uh, non-emergent situations, you know, those with abdominal pain who we can uh, initiate care and then hand off to the on-site physician. What's most interesting so far is of the 60 patients that we've evaluated is the length of stay in the emergency department. So looking at a population test value from last November through March, we've shown a reduction in the length of stay for the discharged patients of about 130 minutes for the telemedicine patients. So that's a significant uh, improvement in flow. The economic model that we're using really is supply chain economics. So we're trying to match that need and the staffing of the physician and nurse. The nurses are paid per hour of telemedicine call, and they're otherwise doing administrative duties when not actively doing uh, telemedicine evaluation. And the physicians are paid on a per case basis, the telemedicine physician. Um, and there's two different rates, one for care to completion, one for care initiated and then handed off. Both those rates are less than the average we would collect per ED patient. So it's a sustainable, cost-effective model. The advantages are it's very patient-centered, it's innovative, there's even potential for education. I've, I've seen a patient with a cutaneous abscess whom I called in a resident to do uh, an incision and drainage on, and I was able to fully supervise and, and discuss actively with that resident and the patient as the procedure was being done, which is fantastic. The, the limitation is that it's very susceptible to selection bias, naturally, because of those of us participating. The future is that if safety and efficacy can be demonstrated, and, and this is something that patients seem satisfied with, and this is something that really can go to the other UC emergency departments, I would venture to guess not only the emergency departments within the UC health system, but non-academic medical centers as well are facing similar challenges of overcrowding and increasing wait times. Larger studies need to be done to really evaluate the process and safety improvement here, um, as well as uh, for, for some systems that have multiple emergency departments, that telemedicine physician can actually see patients potentially in multiple EDs at the same time. So I'd like to thank my mentor and the chair of our department, Dr. David Gus, uh, Benjamin Gus, who's the lead nurse. Our UCSD ED titrate team, which is ever growing, every month we seem to have more nurses and more physicians interested in participating in our project, which is great. We're up to about 15 total now. Uh, and thank you, Terry and the UCOP, for this opportunity and the support. Thank you.